<laughs> All right. Now, the soup pot, this should be, if I am not mistaken, before I get started here, it should be episode seven. Well, let me just double check. I should have checked that. I always did. Yeah. This will be episode seven of the stew pot with Katie right. Andrews and Steve in, in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the stew pot with a good friend of mine, Kenny, the Hurricane Hendricks, and I was known. This is Beef Stew Lou Marconi. I just wanted to welcome him and thank him for coming. This is like a Mother's Day. If you want to say Happy Mother's Day, go right ahead. And hey, Kenny, thanks for coming on. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. this. is a This is a good idea that you uh, that you're doing, man. Talk to all the guys mm -hmm. that uh, you've been around our starting crew and uh, yeah. from wherever you branched out at. But yeah. this is pretty cool. Yeah, I talked to Kid. I talked to Jimmy. I talked to Q. Q Ball was last week. Um, I'm even reaching out to other ones that I've helped in the business, too. Uh, Ronnie Nicole, I don't know if you ever met her. Uh, that should be next week. And following after that, I'm going to meet up with Derek, Derek Stone. So Derek and Derek and you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, Derek, well, when I met you, I just started at Charlie's. I think it was in April of 93. And you guys were already there for a little while. It was you and Derek were there. Were the, were the ones yeah. That yeah, go ahead. Yeah, me and Derek, me and Derek started uh, the same Saturday morning. At the end of January '93, okay. and uh, I actually had a tryout in '91. Um, well, to sort of go back a little before that, my tryout was like January, late January of '91. But how all this sort of ties in is uh, there's a pretty popular gym up here called well now it's called Titans. Okay, back in the Back in the uh, late '80s and '90s, it was it was World Gym, and right, that, um, that Ron there, Cumberledge. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The, all the monsters are there. They were they were all there, and these guys were just powerhouses, bodybuilders, a whole nine. It was it was World Gym. You know, everybody went there. Yeah. But um, so uh, it was like December or November, December of 1990. Well, I, I joined the gym like in 86, okay? And so I didn't really know all the monsters there, you know, but you saw them there every day, you know. That was a place to go to work out from the early to mid-80s on up through now. So anyways, you sort of get to know everybody's face. You don't really know of them. You, you might know their name or not, you know. So one Saturday morning... Like again, November, December of ninety of nineteen ninety, I'm watching WWF TV, and I see Cumberledge on TV. <laughs> I'm like, that's the guy from my gym. I mean, that's crazy. What's see how's he doing this? Whatever. So that was you know November of ninety of nineteen ninety. That was a Saturday. Monday after work, I went to the gym. I went to World Gym. I said, Ron, man, you look great. And he was there were people talking to him. Other monsters were talking to him. I'm like, uh, well, dude, man, how do you get into that? How do you do that? That's what I want to do, you know? He's like, well, you got to come down to the school. There's a tryout, this and that, and blah, blah, blah. So, again, this is around, again, November of 1990. It's getting, it's around the holiday season, so too much crap's going on. Right. He says, well, here's my number. Give me a call after the holidays are over with. We'll meet up and we'll go down. So we finally decided uh, on the late January of 91 to go down to Charlie's school which I think at the time was still, I think it was still affiliated as the Monster Factory in Ohio or something like that, you know. Yeah, it was very sharp, yeah. Yeah, it was still somewhat affiliated with that. And uh, so he picks me up. We meet up. We go down there. We picked up Bill Baker on the way, too. I believe he lived over in Amherst, you yeah. know. I remember so. So, uh, so we make the drive down to uh, Marion, and uh, it's this old building. I'm like, well, what the hell's going on here, man? I'm like, you know, <laughs> what kind of setup is this? So we walk into this building, and this is old gray room. You know, it's like a paint falling off the walls. There's leaks in the ceiling. The ring is like some old beat up, like whatever. I'm like, 
this ain't the WWF. <laughs> Where's all the lights? Where's all the cameras? You know? Where's Where's yeah. Vince McMahon announcing? <laughs> what kind of crap is this? Whatever, you know? So, <laughs> you know, and I remember seeing Chris. Again, we picked up Bill Baker. I think, uh, no, we picked up Scott Summers. One of the, I can't remember which one we picked up. One of those two we picked up, but they were all down there. I remember Scott, yeah. And um, so then, uh, you know, they go through their tryout. They go through their warm-up stuff first, and I'm sitting on the outside. I'm like, you know, kind of, you know, it looks like my attic. You know, I'm like, it looks <laughs> looks worse than this. So, uh, so then I, I get in the room for my tryout, you know, and uh, I run the ropes, whatever, and I, I take the bumps, whatever, and Charlie's like, uh, okay, you know, you. And then I sit out, you know, and he comes over and talks to me, you know, talk, Charlie talks sort of like, uh, hey, you know, uh, so what do you think? Uh, you know, you, you want to be, he's like a slow, smooth talker. He doesn't get all hyped up and angry and blah, blah, blah. He's like, hey, so uh, this is what it takes. You seem to have some type of athletic ability, you know, and, uh, you want to come down and uh, you want to be a part of this? You want to join? I think, yeah, I sure do. I think he, I forget what the, I think it might have been $3,000 back uh, then. I, I know. Well, I've of, I, was, I think it was $1,700. That's what I ended up paying. Well, back when we joined, it was $1,700. Back then, because again, he was still affiliated with the Monster Factory. So okay. I think the cost was a little more. So, yeah, so I'm like, oh, sure, yeah, this is what I want to do. Yeah, sure, you know, so we drive home, and I'm like, Ron, <laughs> you know, like, like, what are you, you know, this is just, what's going on? He's like, well, this is, this is where we practice at, whatever, and we we sort of do our stuff here, and then uh, this is how it all starts. Like, okay, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. I'm like, so all those guys were just, they were big guys to me. So I said, you know, let me take a couple of years, let me work out, try to get a little size, get a little bigger. And finally, I decided, you know what, I'm getting tired of waiting around. So I officially joined January of 93. I called Charlie right after the holidays. I said, hey, I'm interested. I want and then he's like, you know what, the price is only 1700 now because he broke off from Larry Sharp. Yep. So I, uh, you know, so I joined. I, I go down there that Saturday morning. It was a cold winter morning. You know, and uh, he's like, uh, when I called, he's like, you know what? There's going to be a guy starting with you. His name is Derek. You guys are starting on the same day. He's coming in from Kansas. And, uh, yeah, you know, he'll be here. So Derek, that's where I met, you know, where I met Derek. Was, yeah, Derek was married at the time, I think, to Gracia. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember Derek. Yeah, Derek was there and you were there. Um, I because I, I tried out in February, but I started in April because I said, Let me pull some money together, and he we kind of worked out a payment plan. And I said, I Yeah, yeah, a plan. Plan. plan, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. that's where, uh, yeah, so I, I, I met you know, that's where I met Bill down from uh, a Dayton. Um, yeah. I met Lumbering Jack, <laughs> that was Matt, yeah, that was Matt, big guy. Yeah, he was big man. Yeah, and uh, I think I'm not quite sure if Rod Capino was there or not, you know, but uh, he was there. He might have been was, there that day, you know. Yeah, Rod was like, he was like the father to all of us because he was 30, he was in his late 30s and he wasn't that big, he was shorter, but he could work. Right. He could work. I remember yeah. he, he, he really had the heart to do it. It was just a shame that he, if he was maybe, you know, 20 years younger or 15 years younger, he, he would have bought it been able to do something but he had a wife and he had a family he was just doing it because he always wanted to and just to be in the locker room you know it was fun for him so right so yeah um that's kind of where it all started from seeing ron on tv ron cumberlich on tv back in 1990 having my trout in 91 officially joining in 93 and yeah. then uh and then uh we went to practice you know i mean you live in cleveland i was on the east side of cleveland you know, so it's a two and a half hour trip. You know, it's a it's a five hour tri- it's a five hour round trip. Yep. I did that twice a week. You know, usually on a Wednesday or Saturday or Saturday and Monday, whatever. You know, we went twice a week and we paid our dues. We went to practice. You know, and I do find there's a lot of there's a lot of kids. I say probably ninety percent of the kids, if we can call them that, they just don't want to put in the effort, man. You know, they don't want to drive, you know, they don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. They'd rather be on social media or some crap like that, whatever, you know, or whatever. They just, you know, they, they, they've seen how glamour 
glamorized it is on TV, and they want yeah. it right now. You know? Yeah. You got to work Nobody your ass off for that. Hard. I remember, well, I remember Charlie's ring. When I talked to people, the ring that we trained in, because I heard all these horror stories about wrestling school before I even got into it, where you get beaten up for your first month or two before they smarten you up. And they'll see if they've got anything with you. Charlie didn't do that. What he did was he had the hardest ring ever in and I've ever been in. And if he said, if you can work in this ring, if you can bump and work in this ring, you can bump and work anywhere. That's what he told right. me. But he didn't tell me that until after I was there for a month because I thought all rings were that hard. I, was, I remember just taking, I was like, wow. I remember after doing that for a couple hours and you drive another two and a half hours, you're trying to get out of your car. We were both from Cleveland. I was from the west side, you're from the east side. Right. And I just remember that, just coming out of my car going, wow, you know, just, wow, this is sore. But I didn't dare complain about it because I knew if I complained, I'd lose everybody's respect. So I remember the ring being st like stiff, and it was like a concrete floor almost. It was just that hard. Right. But that he, did is, that, uh, he did that to weed out the weak, to make sure if you had it in you or not. That's what, I think that's the way he did it. So Yeah, I, I know there, there's – I've seen a lot of different training styles over the years, and – a lot of trainers now, they like to beat up the guys, you know, and that's just not my thing. I wouldn't beat them up. They would have to, I mean, beat them up like in a trial as far as running the ropes or push-ups, whatever. They do a lot of stuff like that, but I don't think some of the trainers can do that themselves. So I wouldn't put it on them, but they would give it a good work over, over in the gym, in the ring, you know. They would take the slams, you know, they could, again, the way Charlie trained us, it's just the way it was sort of taught and it's kind of my old school belief in a sense. But I do know at the at the WWE training center, they put them through a workout, you know, and yeah. uh, I think they did it at the uh, what do you call it? The, oh, uh, okay. what is it, the power or something, whatever you call it, WCW's yeah, power. power. Or whatever it was called back then, I, I can't remember. Yeah, you know? it was at, uh, yeah that was by, uh, I think, Craig Pittman ran that one. I think it was Sergeant Craig Pittman. Um, why don't you tell me about your first match? Because um, when did you have your first match in front of people? Well, mm -hmm. the first the first match was actually, uh, well, just a battle royal. That's, you know. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that was out in Norwalk, whatever, you know, and that was just, you know, all my friends came out, you know, and it was just, you know, again, it was like showtime. I'm nervous as hell, you know, I mean, it's just like, this is what it all comes down to, you know, I was the same way and um, <laughs> being in front of the crowd, whatever. And I tried to stay in the ring as long as possible, but right, uh, you got you got thrown out and that was it. But it was cool. It was good. That's a good way to break the ice of all wrestlers. Put them in a battle royal, get them used to the people, get them used to other wrestlers, other workers, the crowd, and then, uh, you know, uh, that's it. Break them in that way, you know. Yeah. But the first singles match was against you, Cleveland Agora. Really? JT Show. That was, uh, that was Cleveland All-Pro Wrestling. Yeah. Exactly. That was probably. I thought you were April, going to come. It was probably April. Didn't you wrestle Doink the Clown at WWF before that? Yeah. No, 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 no. You and I were the first match. That was yeah, like an eight, you know, and um, had some people from school come watch us, whatever. We had a good match, you know. We uh, he had a nice crowd there, a good setup. And uh, so, yeah. But yeah. shortly I after that, uh, I think we all got a call from uh, Charlie, and he was like, you know what, the uh, – WWF, they're going to be in town. They're going to need you down in, uh, I think it was Columbus. And, um, you know, yeah. can you make it? I'm like, yeah, I can make it for sure. You know, so that's uh, that's when things start to really heat up as far as uh, this is this is it, you know, the things that I practice for, you know, this is um, the things that I see on TV. And uh, so, yeah, that was like in June of 93 so five months after starting practicing basically yeah june of 93 had my first wwf <laughs> match in a sense what i call a match so yeah that, no that was yeah it was i think you had matt Bourne for my he was doing the clown at the time wasn't it yeah exactly yeah yeah it was a How good match it's a good way to break you know me into the the big league so to speak 
you know. But mm-hmm. uh, it was cool. It was a good match. From what I remember. Fun. I remember watching on TV and Vince McMahon was commentating. And he said, this is uh, Kenny Hendricks against Doink the Clown. No relation to Jimi Hendrix, which was hilarious. <laughs> did, you, did you remember that? Yeah, well, I, I, get, I was... I, I put this thing on Facebook about a month ago, how the WWF tapings were done. Because they yeah. really film three, two, or they, I think it's three shows in one night. In the four and a half hour, five hour period. Yeah. So it's a long night. And so on TV, it was Bobby the Brain Heenan commentating along with somebody else. It might have been Vince. I don't know. I but uh, yeah, okay. So I don't know if they commentating if they were commentating backstage, you know. And then there's one that they put on TV. Who knows how they set it up, you know? I think they did it post production. I think they did all their commentary post production. Almost positive, they but might. They, they might have. That's, yeah, I think they, that's the magic of TV. They can the magic of tapings. You can right. film something, go back and re you know uh, commentate afterwards and make it more exciting. So. I've seen them go out there and make guys go out and do the match all over again. If something didn't go right, they make them go out and do it again. I've seen that happen a couple of times. So, right, right. Yeah, because I remember there was – you. I remember there was one time, because the one time we, you and I went together, and I was, it was a group of us with Derek and Billy and Matt. And it was a mm-hmm. group of us in the van. And um, you – didn't you get Yokozuna? Yeah, I had Yokozuna. I had – well – I had was he okay? I had uh well done. I had well done. Zuna and Crush. That might have been a '94 or something like that. It was a it was a a, a, a tag match. My yeah. partner, we had the same outfit on, so they put us in the same match. They yeah, put he, us in a tag he, match. Yeah, against he had, he, Zuna and Crush. Yeah. Did I think I think we did. I think, I think we did two nights. I think we did two nights. We did. A Tuesday, and then I think we did Tuesday over in Erie, and Wednesday down in West Virginia, or something like that. Whatever. Yeah, I, I sure I remember. But didn't didn't something happen with the kid your your team? Because the kid you team with wasn't with us. He was with that North Carolina group that came up with George South and uh, Italian Stallion, and um, he, he he like something happened. Like he just completely blacked out out there. He didn't know where he was. Do you remember that? Uh, I think the match that he had after our match. Or something I can't remember, or maybe the next day and over in uh, West Virginia, he did this move where he went out of the ring and his head and shoulders landed on the mat, and Ooh. then his other side of his body came up like this. So he was I like, think I think it's on, a, it's probably on YouTube, and he just, it was an awkward landing. Yeah. You know, he wasn't really a, well, we, I, I, he wasn't really a big guy and we weren't all that big, but I don't think he had much, uh, yeah. much size, whatever, but he just landed real wrong and his legs came up over here or something like that. And yeah. I can't remember how the rest of the match went. I think, as a matter of fact, I think, uh, Sean, what's his name? One, two, three kid. He's like, Sean. man, your partner just took a real bad bump and outside the ring. Because, you know, everybody's sort of back there or whatever. And he's like, oh, really? So I don't know who he is. You know, so they just put us together the night before in that tag match. So, yeah, he took a real bad fall. Yeah, they made you in a tag team. Huh. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think in, um, yeah, because I, I, I remember those tapings. Because I remember I, I, that's the, the night that um, I got Bob Holly or something like that. Then I had the head shrinkers the next night. So. It was just what I was teamed up with a guy from North Carolina. They just put us together and said, Go out there and work in the head shrinkers. Okay. <laughs> so, I had a chance. Well, actually, the, the same night as we worked Yokozuna and Crush, they put us together in another match against uh, a team called Well Done. Yep. Well and done. Uh, it's kind of funny. I can't find that match on YouTube or any place, nowhere. But uh, a friend of mine from uh, Akron. He actually has a contact, and he found this match somewhere. Like, I, had not, I haven't seen that match in like twenty-five something years, whatever. You know, so I got I don't. I don't have a DVD. Uh, a DVD player. So I got to get a DVD player and play it. Yeah. You know, and I want to see what it looks like. It's yeah. been, you know, 
that was like in '94, and this is whatever the 2020. So yeah, I'm thinking, but, yeah. So we did two matches that night. Then the next night we did uh, another match. So yeah, that was yeah. I remember those those days. I remember that was fun. We had a lot of fun doing those. But it was so cool just to be a part of it, just to be back there, and just to be like yeah, people know. just like. I remember what you were telling me, like, when, because it was my, I think it was my first night, because you went before me once. So I was, I was a little bit behind you guys, because I started later. And you're like, okay, don't freak out when you meet anybody. <laughs> Just be cool. Do you remember that? Because you, you, you want Yeah, to. well, it's like, uh, Charlie's like, when you get there, you know, when you check in with uh, Tony Gurria and Rene Goulet and whoever else, Strong don't man. act like a fan. Yeah. Don't go ask for autographs. Don't go hang around. Don't go asking for whatever. Hey, how do you work out? Whatever. Just leave these guys alone because that's their job. You go there, you check in, and then you shut up. Yeah. You wait for your assignments. You got to act, act professional. So, yeah, it's one thing to see these guys on TV, you know, like in the 80s, whatever, and all this stuff, early 90s. And now we're a part of it. Yeah. You know, we're we're a part of it, you know. And so that's, that was something that I'll, of course, never forget. And it's uh, very special. Were you always a fan growing up watching wrestling? Like a, as a kid? As a child? Uh, well, back in the 70s, my brother really watched it a, a lot. I didn't really care for it. It was just like, who's going to watch this crap? You know? <laughs> and then I started seeing guys that were a little more muscular in it as well. I'm like, yeah. well, that guy looks like he can kick some ass, whatever, you know? And so... Um, I became more of a fan when I started seeing more muscular guys just, uh, you know, kicking ass, you know. And then I That's saw tough. Jimmy Snook in a cage match, you know, and that was just like, man, that guy is, that guy yeah. is a real deal. You know? So The Road that, Warriors. Uh, that, you remember the Road Warriors in AWA? You saw them on TV. They, you were like, wow, look at those guys. They were just huge. They were, just, they were they monsters. Them. Monsters. Yeah. They didn't have to know how to work. They were just monsters, but they knew how to work. So they knew, yeah, they oh yeah, they knew how they knew how to do things. Yeah. And they, were, they were pretty good about that. Um, I was just thinking because I remember the one guy that scared the hell out of me. I was in middle school, and it was Nikita Kola. <laughs> because I just was like, I was in middle school at the time when he was like, he had to work. He had to he wrestled Flair for the world title at Great American Bash. I'm like, gonna kill him. He's gonna kill him. What the hell is this? Yeah. So, I remember those days? Like, how just. He was just a, he was a scary dude, but today if you turn on wrestling, you see guys like half that size or even smaller that are on TV. You remember that? You know yeah, that you know? I don't really watch it now. I haven't really watched it for like on a I'll turn it on here and there and flip the channels, whatever you know. But um, I really haven't watched it on a regular basis for about I maybe over ten years. It's just. I don't know. It just seems like it's too much glamorized in a sense. It's too much showmanship. I guess it's supposed to be showmanship, but it's less, I don't know. It's just, it's less work. It's, you know, it's more, it it's, more it's more talk, more BS backstage yeah. stuff. It's just like, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's not, it's not fun for me anymore. So I really don't watch it. I'll, I'll watch older stuff I find on YouTube. Because I was going through, um, just going through the YouTube feed earlier today, I found the match. It was Ernie Ladd and against Andre the Giant. You know, that's something that's, I watched. Yeah, yeah, Ernie, you know, something like that. So, but okay, I can get so, all those old matches anytime. You know, like old WWF matches, NWA matches, the whole shows. I can just, I can put one of those matches on at the gym and do cardio, or whatever, and just get lost for like a good half hour, and just you know. That's just nowadays. It's just, it's just, it's just I don't I don't relate to it nowadays. So, but and that's just it's just me. <laughs> you know, that's just me. That it's not saying anything bad. It's just not relatable to me in a sense. You know. Well, the, right now, instead of having you know guys that are because really before you got to WWF back then, I was in the territories. You you were groomed. You were trained. And you worked every night. You wrestled every night in front of people. And you worked on your character, you worked on your gimmick, and you worked on your ring persona, and you learned how to identify with an audience. Guys like Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Junkyard Dog, they did that in Mid-South with Bill Watts for years. Ted D. Gross right. before he became the Million Dollar Man. That's just, that's just, Bill, that's just Mid-South. Then you go to the guys like Jimmy Valiant and Crockett. He wrestled for years before he became the Boogie Woogie Man and this, this kind of goofy babyface gimmick. But 
you know, yeah. these, you're, uh, Roddy Piper is another great example. I mean, he wasn't that big, but he and he could talk. Boy, could he talk. Orndorff worked yeah. in Georgia forever in Florida. You know, just talk, just talking about places like they don't have places like that anymore. They kind of they train them, they bring them along a little bit. Then they try to fit these people into these characters that TV writers are writing for them, and they don't know how to relate to a crowd or draw money. It's, it's like, yeah, that's probably one of the bad things about the way wrestling is now. And you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, back in the day, you had different territories. You could work, you can go work an area six months a year or plus, then go to a different area, work over there, then back over here, whatever, and then get a, get a call up, whatever, you know. But now then they have a training center. You don't get too much of a flavor of all the different areas. You have one type, one one size fits all, will mold you. And so I think a person, a wrestler nowadays, they may get lost on, um, you know, what they're trying to, what they're trying to, um, you may get lost in your own, your character might get lost. Yeah. You know, yeah. become something that you don't want to be. And there's only so many spots now. Anyway, like back in Memphis, Tennessee, because remember Tommy Dreamer telling me you should go to Memphis because anybody that's ever been anything in the business has gone through Memphis, Tennessee at some point in time. Some point in time they were there. That includes Hulk Hogan. He was there. He was there. He actually, you know, he put over Jerry Lawler in the main event, which really you know, Lawler was, he owned part of the company. So, I mean, that's why he always made his money. But um, All right. Guys that were there forever, yeah. There's, there's just times that you know, Tom. You could even go to Tommy Rich days or even anybody else, but they knew how. That's how they learned. I mean, you could have went up and worked for Vern for a while, or you could have went to Texas and worked for, for the Von Erics, or you could have worked for Paul Bosch in Houston. There were so many territories, so many places to go, or go to Florida and work for Eddie Graham. And it's just you know, nowadays there's no, you can't do it. And that's what a lot of the, I think the young people today, and I don't want to sound like an old man. It, they don't understand it because if they if they pull up on YouTube, just like pull up a pull up like a Magnum TA match, Magnum TA Tully Blanchard, you know, just something right. like just watch it, just watch. They're like, wow, this is great. Yeah, you don't see that today. I mean, actually, and the other thing, Al Snow pointed this out. Do you, you remember when we were trained? We were trained to call matches in the ring, right? We call. Yeah, it? you had you know you had your uh, start. He had your finish, and then uh, you sort of right. work you out talk, the details later, so to speak. The heel, the heel or the veteran usually calls it. You, you, you know, one guy leads, one guy follows a little bit. Sometimes you work together so many times, and so for so long, you get it. You know, you kind of you can also feed off of each other very well. But right, right. Guys memorize everything in the locker room, and they go out and do it in the ring, and they're so worried about forgetting something, they forget to sell. They forget to let the move happen. Like they got hit with this big move. And instead of laying there and selling for a little bit or working their way, you know what I mean? Let the people take in what happened. They're up and they're running the ropes to the next spot. And it's like, slow down, take your time. You know, you know, there's no reason to rush. So that's what I noticed. Well, yeah, I think a lot of kids, you know, everybody's so nervous and so they're so anxious, you know, they want to get in and they want to, you know, they want to do a bunch of high spots, whatever, you know, top rope moves or whatever. And just, they just got to learn the basics, you know. It's one thing Charlie said, if, you know, if you, if you learn five or six things and working those to the top, your five basic things, whatever, you know, and work those to the max or to your best of your ability, you know, and show some heart and some some effort, you know, that's yeah. going to take you a long way and with a good attitude as well. So Yeah, a good attitude and everything else. I was told, the, you know, Charlie, told, like the psychology of it, was Charlie would talk that a lot too, was like baby faces don't cheat. You know, heels do the cheating. You know, don't right. you know? Baby faces don't throw punches because the punt. He just it don't do any. He he that he never taught us punches. That was like the last thing we learned. Right, right. Because he didn't. He wanted us to be able to wrestle and learn how to work and you know, you know, reverse holds. I mean, he 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 was more like this. He wanted us to have the basics so that way we could go and work anywhere. We can have a match with anybody. And he said that. He said that once we were there for a year. He says you guys can work with anybody. And he says you can get in there and you can have a match with anybody. That's that was his that was his philosophy and it worked. Today, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you gotta look look where he came from. I mean, he was a a journeyman for the WWF. So I think our group really has a lot of. Oh, we have a lot of history. Number one, but number two, we have some good roots of how we were trained. Yeah. We were trained by one of the, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best in the business. Whatever you know, and. Uh, yeah. We just have a lot of history with our group, and that's a great thing, you know. Yeah. 
Well, I always talked to Charlie regularly before he passed away. And he, he was saying that he, he, what about us was that he, he, he said that because he, he was, you're going to go and work shows for people. You could tell when somebody's not trained. You could tell just how they carry themselves or how they even lace up their boots. And he was right. He was absolutely right. <laughs> right. And it's, you just think, yeah, they can't even hit the ropes right half the time. It was like, wow. You know, I, I've never uh, walked out of a show before. And this one time, I wish I would have, you know, because the promoter and he's an area promoter i'll say that he's in the cleveland area and uh he was working his match backstage you know and uh he's like okay he's like so after i get in the ring and i grab his arm what do i do <laughs> i'm like oh man do i really want to be here you know i mean I, it, it wasn't my match so i didn't really didn't care but for the integrity of the business, the business yeah. that I was a part of, do I really want to be a part of this match, this show that yeah. the promoter doesn't even know how to do, doesn't know how to do your basic moves, you know, but I, I stayed in it, you know, whatever. So well, I remember after we were there for a little while with Charlie, we combined gyms with Kid Collins it was around 95 ish, 96, I think. And then, um, yeah, it's at least a year or so, a year and a half, two years, like after, after we joined. Yeah. You know, because it just, uh, you know, it just, it just uh, how the progression was, whatever, you know. I think wasn't the building, Charlie's building, he was losing his lease or closing down or maybe the, the uh, enrollment declined or something. I think um, it was in the future body gym. It was in a, it was in a gym in Marion. Right. And I think the gym was closing, so Charlie had to leave. And so he combined, he brought his ring up to Mike's gym, and they yeah. pretty much Mike took over. I think Charlie kind of got away from it after that. Um, right. But but he came down, and we he did we did shows, and he come to shows and everything. I remember that. Um, but yeah, so so right now, I want to talk to Jimmy. He picked up like about ten years ago. He started running the ASWA again, and it's been right. all, all ever since. So you guys had the best tag team. You and you and Jimmy Lee have the best tag. Oh, uh, Jimmy Hendrix experience, you know. I actually, uh, I was, uh, I was at the, uh, of course, I was at the gym when I was, and I was like about just about maybe six years ago, and I'm like, I said, you know, me and Jimmy ought to tag, you know, and uh, I gave him a call right then and there. I said, hey, you know, I think we should be like, you know, the Jimmy Hendrix experience, whatever, or the Jimmy Hendrix tour, whatever, you know, and uh, so I put the ideal in his head and i think after about a year two years we finally went with it whatever you know and i like it. it's one of my favorite ever i mean it fits it yeah. works i think yeah. you know if we were 20 years younger we could probably do something <laughs> more with it you know expand you know but it's definitely one of my favorite tag team partners you know when you could tag with a person that you got history roots history with you know i mean why not it's a lot of fun you know a lot of yeah. fun was um i'm gonna ask you this because when you first started too i'm gonna tell you my, my personal experience my family really wasn't that supportive of me doing it well how was your family when you when you saw well, you know this? your mom doesn't want to see you get beat up whatever you know so and uh <laughs> I, I think when she saw the uh when she saw the doink the clown match that wasn't really a big deal neither was um, there's another, I, I thought, or, uh, um, what's his name? Mike, Erwin R. Scheister, Mike, Mike Rotundo. Rotundo, yeah. I had a match with him. I can't find that match no place neither, but I, I you know, I, I got some guy looking for that one now, but, uh, so that match wasn't too bad, but when she saw me go up against Crush, Yokozuna, and then Vader, you know, yeah. Yeah, Vader you was my most, uh, huh? Wait, you were, you wrestled Vader? I wrestled Vader. That was my, I'll say that was my most painfulest match when he gave me the, uh, I think, belly to belly. Wow. And so, yeah, yeah I think yeah, he gave me the belly to belly. And then he gave me the, uh, he dove off the second rope. You know, that was pretty, uh, you Ooh. know, I consider myself a veteran after that, you know, but. 
But yeah, but yeah. So when she, when she, you know, when she, she didn't like seeing your, you don't like seeing your kid getting beat up, you know. So you know, whatever, yeah. you know. But well, uh, yeah. Well, well, what's the turning point? Because I, I wasn't that. They thought I was crazy. But then once they saw me on TV for WWF, they were like, okay, they're like, hey, he's gonna do this, so we might as well let him do it. <laughs> I just kind of yeah. realized. It looks like I she, never came, she never came to any of my matches, you know. She only saw the ones that I had taped, whatever, or the ones that were on WWF, whatever. My, my dad and uh, my dad and my sister, my brother in law, and my niece and nephew, they came, you know. So, and uh, and my brother came to a match too. So, you know, everybody's cool with it, you know. Yeah. So, that's cool. You know. Well, no, that's good. That's good. Really? They just yeah. thought I was crazy. I was 19 when I started. They were like, what are you? Like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? It was, it was just one of those. But you, you got to understand, it, I always say this to anybody that wants to get into business, you have to be cut out for it. And it's a lot in your heart and mental. It's like, you got to really, you got to be, you got to have heart, you got to be mentally tough, much as physically tough to do this. Because you're, you're beaten up. It actually, it beats on your body for a while. And you just have to be tougher than that. Yeah, I'm actually, uh, you know, we all have our injuries, whatever, you know, so I've uh, at least once a month while we were working, um, I would get I get like deep tissue uh, massages. I get um, I get cupping done. You know, I try to see the chiropractor probably once every four or five months. I have a um, it's a herniated discs like C2 through C6. Mm -hmm. We're more focused on C4 through C6, and it takes away some of the strength in my right arm and shoulder, you know. And uh, but so I try to be proactive to keep yeah. that nerve untouched, so I can get my strength back. So it's a it's a process, you know. It's when you get older, you know, things don't really <laughs> snap back that way, right? So, and it happens. Um, it happens. You get beat up. Yeah. You get older. How much longer we're going to be doing this for? You know, because it's starting to the wear and tear. I mean, you know what it's all about—the wear and tear—and uh, you got to take care of yourself. And yeah, no doubt about it. You know, I think one of the reasons I keep going is after Jimmy Lee got it going again, the ASWA got that promotion going again, stronger. You know, um, I was talking with Charlie, and. Uh, you know, we were just talking about this and that, whatever, and the history, this, you know, and, and everything. He was like, uh, he's like, Ken, you seem to have a lot of talent and everything, but uh, I don't think you put that, yeah, I think you could have put more effort into it, you know. I think you could have could have been more driven, you know. And I was like, wow, you know. It was sort of, it was kind of a, like, it kind of bummed me out a little bit. I mean, I said, dude, I, I drove five hours round trip, whatever, you know, but he was like, uh, He's like, I think he could have put more effort into it. He seemed to uh, didn't put a lot of effort in, or more effort into it. I'm like, wow, you know. So I guess that's why I'm still at it now because I, I you know, I, I do have a feel. I got much, I got much more to give. But right. you got to, you got to weigh what your brain. You got more to give in your brain, okay. But what's your body got? You know, your your, your yeah. body. You know, so you got, you got to try to find a point and th to win this game. You want to be able to walk away on your terms, healthy, and uh, to be able to live a good life afterwards, you know, after you retire from the business, retire from your job, you know, um, you know, I've been pretty fortunate to be uh, employed throughout, you know, my wrestling career, you know, and um, I have weekends pretty much free. Right. So I can go on these, um, do the shows without any problems of missing work, whatever, you know. But so, right. again, you want to be able to leave this game on your terms, you know. And then, but I don't want to, there's, there's so many, there's, there's a few guys who I think they get caught up in the retirement party, you know, this, that, blah, 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 blah. And then eight months later, they come back. <laughs> it's like, quit watching TV, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you're gone or you're not. Whatever. It's just that's just my thinking. Whatever you know, you get you get that fish. You get that itch because people are asking me now, and I said, well, you know, my daughters are young right now. Maybe when they get older. I mean, I got 
Isabella, my oldest, is going to be five. But when he gets older. <laughs> well, well, I got one that's five, and I got one that's going to turn three next month. I got one that's going to be five in September. A couple of years from now, it might be, you know, when they're not toddlers anymore, body trained, you know, they're a lot more manageable. It's maybe then I could do it, but may, maybe I'm not saying for sure or not, but I just, you know, I'm doing my own thing. And I, I like doing the podcast just to talk to people and have them come out. Just yeah, it's a good thing, man. This is very, this is pretty cool, you know. I don't, um, uh, I don't do too much traveling no more, you know. It's just, it's, it's, you know, you're, when you're when you're older, you just can't, you just don't feel like it. You, 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 when you're when you're home on a weekend, you're like, this is pretty nice. <laughs> if there was sports, yeah, I mean, you know? when I when I wrestle, I wrestled down at uh, in, in Marion for Savage Anarchy Wrestling, and. Uh, I like that town because, you know, that's where Irene's there. That's where Charlie and Irene lived. And uh, so when yeah. I go down there to Russell, I stay at Irene's place. We hang out. We eat, have dinner after the show. And I sleep over. And then I come home. So, you know, um, the you know, I don't. Uh, and then when I wrestle in Akron for Rubber City Wrestling, that's only less than an hour away. So I just come right back home, whatever, you know. But I don't, um, the, the the thrill, the, 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 uh, the, the 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 drive to drive five six hours just is not not there no more. I I remember I drove. I got called for a match in Washington D.C. Uh, probably like in two thousand two or whatever two thousand three, and I drove to Washington D.C. for a match. I left Sunday. If it was a Sunday afternoon match, it was like two o'clock match. So I left Cleveland at like five thirty a.m. I got there at about one, getting wow. lost in this and that, and then did the match. We were done at four, and then I uh, I got home like at twelve thirty, one o'clock, whatever you know. But yeah, you know, I did that. Okay. I remember getting a call for a match down at uh, down in, in Ironton, Ohio. Where's that at? It's at the bottom of Ohio. <laughs> you know, like and I never I never knew that. I never knew where it was, but as a matter of fact, who called me were the Batten twins. If you okay. know Bart and Brett Batten, I forget. I know Bart, whatever, and his brother. They called me for that match, whatever, you know, down in. I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. No problem. I can be there. That's a good price, blah, blah, blah. So I get on the map, whatever. I'm like, well, there's Cleveland, okay. Well, there's Columbus, and Ironton is you know, it's down <laughs> there. You know, so <laughs> I t- it's it's a good four and a half, five hours away. I'm like, oh, you know, so um, yeah. I don't really do. Uh, I don't really I don't go out of state no more. I don't, I don't drive to the bottom of Ohio no more. You know, right. so I mean, I don't know. It's just number one. It's it's it's, it's the drive is not there no more. Number one. Number two. Gosh, you know, not to get all into it, whatever, you know, but Go ahead. in light of recent events, you know, you know, it's it's uh, to be coming home. There's many times back in the 90s where, I mean, you've done it too, where, where you know, you drive to a match, or you drive to a strange town. Again, not to, you know, me being an, an African-American wrestler. Yeah, going to some of these small towns. I got gotcha. you. Somebody like me, we don't know what's gonna go on. Like, right. we don't right. know what's gonna go on in the in the stands. You know, this and that in the town. We don't know yeah. the history of the town. There wasn't Google back then. You know, so <laughs> right. You I mean, gotta look out for yourself. You gotta protect yourself. And I know what you're saying. Well, you know, back then, it's, it's like, yeah, you protect, you protect yourself, but you were sort of in the unknown. Yeah. You're in the unknown of people's thought process. Somebody like myself, I know racism is out there, you know. Oh. You know it's out there. But, again, going through these small towns, you, you don't know, you know. And back then, I, it wasn't a, really a, a, a thought, but nowadays, it's, 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 it's a thought you know, it's a possibility, and because well, you just, you know, you don't know. So now, yeah, you know, you got to protect yourself. You have you to protect. With, just to so you know, if you were with me or any other Charlie's guys, 
you, we would have had your back. You know that. If, oh, yeah, I'm not worried about that. But, again, it's just, you, you know, uh, when you get a call from a, a promoter or something like that, and because after we sort of branched off, we right. sort of developed our own contacts. Yeah, we all got and our so, own stuff, right. Yeah, we had our own bookings, whatever, you know. So, yeah, I may get a call from wherever schmuck you know and uh we got to go here back then the show started at at eight o'clock you know you did the yeah. show you're done by 10 30 or so you drive home at 11 you know so it's just anyways I remember, I'm, you, know, you know again you just gotta we walked out of a restaurant once i don't know if you remember this or not me you jimmy and a group of us jimmy was with us because mm-hmm. we were we were at a Denny's because you were with us. The waitress never came over or something like that. They wouldn't serve us. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? Fine. We'll go somewhere else. And we did. I remember, I saw, do you remember that? Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't know what year that was. You know, I mean. Yeah, but I remember but, yeah, um, we were looking for Bubba Rose, I think, down in West Virginia. It was some small town place. We, we went to a Denny's. We went to just, it was like, I, I think it was a Denny's. It was some, it was a, we ended up going somewhere else. We ended up going to a truck stop or something. I said, I don't care. I mean, it just, it's, it's just, it was ridiculous. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, you know, I, I, I know the guys have my back and that's, that's a good thing, you know. Um, but there I are a lot of times when you're alone. As a matter of fact, one quick story here. I remember we had a, that first battle royal over at Norwalk, whatever, right? Yeah. That was in 93. My first match. I think your first match, whatever. You know, the Battle Royal. And then um, I think they decided to go back there maybe six months later or something like that or whatever. Uh, I think maybe eight months or a year later. I forget when. But driving home that night, um, you know, it's a long, dark road. You know, there's nobody on the road. I'm yeah. doing like 75, whatever, you know. And I, I passed a trooper or a cop. You know, and, uh, you know, the lights come on, you know, and you turn around. Of course, I stopped. It's pitch black out, you know, and, uh, you know, nothing happened. Thank God. Everything was cool. You can have my license. You can have my registration. I'm not one of these guys that are like, dude, man, what did I do, bro? <laughs> you know, well, that was that. That, you know, was that was a was That was a yeah, go ahead. But yeah, uh, you know, nothing, uh, you know, again, it's about 11 o'clock at night. And uh, and I know what you're getting ready to say. <laughs> you remember that story? We were, huh? on our way to, we were both on our way to training with different cars. I, got I remember. Yeah, yeah. This is, this, is, this is where it helps to be black. This is where it helps to be black. Go ahead. I, I got the ticket and you didn't. But that was me being an idiot. I was like, I was like, dude, I wasn't going. I was going to the speed limit. Because, no, you weren't. Get out. Get out of the car. Come back here. He's like, he was yelling at me. I was like, wow. <laughs> I said, all right. I paid well, yeah, we were to practice. This is probably, I think this was a, a, a weekday, probably, uh, yeah. uh, who knows, Wednesday or whatever. Anyways, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> an African-American trooper pulled me <laughs> over. When he gets out the car, I'm like, whoo, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and uh, I said, yes, sir. No, sir. Right away, sir. You know, and he checked me out. Of course, nothing was, nothing yeah, was I, going on. And he let me go. And uh, uh, I think Charlie or Irene were like, uh, "Where's Lou? He's coming down to practice, right?" I said, "I guess he's coming." And he came in like a half hour later or whatever it was, forty five minutes later. And yeah, I got pulled over. I'm like, oh yeah, I said, I did too. You're like, uh, who'd you get pulled over by? I'm like, yeah, it was a black trooper. And you're like, yeah, well, so did I. And I got a ticket. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> yeah, at uh, time, uh, yeah, I remember that ninety three or ninety four, whatever it was. You that know? was on. That was on me because it, I was. I gave him an attitude, and I was lying because I was speeding, but I tried to tell him I wasn't. And right. What are you doing? What are you doing? So about yeah, I was. I was late. That's why I was going so fast because I was late. So and I had to pay the ticket, so I did. Charlie just kind of shook his head. He went, he was like Ledfoot or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, too, I, I understand your, your, your obvious concern and trepidation when you're going to places by yourself, and especially on the unknown town. I will tell you this. One thing I will say, because you've met my wife and my wife's biological father's black. Her mother was mm-hmm. white. 
she's biracial. Mm -hmm. My, both mm -hmm. my are one quarter black. So, but we lived in, we were, we were an interracial couple and we lived in North Carolina for six years and we never had a problem. So, but you know, I'm, we might've had never to our faces. Nobody ever said anything to us. So that was always a good thing. And I, I hope, I, I, I hope we do make the progress we're supposed to make. Which reminds me, you know, I, we, we both have the shirt on. You want to tell people about the shirt that you're wearing? Yeah, this is just, um, like, yeah, it's the light here. Inspirational yeah. strength, yeah. It's, um, I, I'm in the gym quite a bit, you know, and um, I kind of just wanted my own shirt, you know, for just my own personal gym shirt, whatever, you know, uh, just kind of what I'm all about in a sense, you know, and I work with these guys uh, at the Arnold Classic, you know, the Max Green Printing Company. Um, and they have an, a clothing line called the Iron Demon Clothing Line. And uh, I've been working with those guys for about, I don't know, about um, probably about 12, 13, 14 years at the Arnold Classic. Of course, we didn't have it this Nobody had it this year because it was whatever, you know, the Corona thing. Anyways. So I saw this design where the black and white arms were sort of locked in together, so to speak, whatever, you know. I got the and white. uh I got the white Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um uh, and um I'm like, wow, that's that's kinda cool, but I don't want to sort of steal that. Let's see if I can make it a little more muscular <laughs> since it's really about yeah. you know, it's it's strength. That's kind of what I'm about, working out, whatever, you know. Right. So I made like, I don't know, like 12 shirts up, whatever, just for myself and some family members, whatever. And then um, people sort of, I got a, some good feedback out of it, you know. And then um, the guys over at Max Screen Printing, they're out in Painesville. And um, they, I guess somebody got a hold of the uh, some people over at Fox 8 News about yeah. two and a half years ago. Yep. And then uh, they did a story on the shirts in the shop and, you know, what I was doing it for. Because there is, back then, as there is now, there's still a lot of racial tension. Yeah. And it's 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 fed by the media, part of um, it. And it's of fed it, by it's actions. Fed by and social media, too. I think it's fed by the internet. But it's clickbait, a lot of stuff. It's fed by the actions of what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. with the recent release of the uh, the videotape down in uh, Georgia, that was the they event happened in February. Yeah, yeah, it happened in February. That yeah. The tape was released this past week, and just just, anyway. just just so people are understanding, like that are listening, and might not know what we're talking about. There was a young man that was shot in Georgia. It was believed that he was jogging, and these two guys came up to him and approached him on a in, in a truck, and one of them was a former cop, and the other one was his son. They fought, they confronted him, and the confrontation turned violent, and they ended up shooting him and killing him because they thought he committed a crime, or that's what their statement was. And the reason why I read one article about this, the reason why it took so long to arrest him, because the first two prosecutors had to recuse themselves because they knew him because he was a former cop. They couldn't do it. They did like because it would have been a mistrial. So they had to get a prosecutor that was able to uh, issue the arrest ones. That's what I heard. I don't know how true that yeah. is. Or those guys deserve to be arrested and go to jail. They need. They're gonna yeah, have the I time. Kinda, I, I kind of heard that too. And um, yeah, but that, but people are knowing that, that's what we're talking. Uh, what's his name? Um, Ahmad Arbery. Is that is that is that the yeah. name? Well, okay, Arbery. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the young gentleman that was out jogging, whatever, you know, but, and uh, I, I heard the police saw the tape and the police wanted to arrest them. But like you said, the the prosecutor, or district attorney, you know, they were former co-workers with the cop or whatever. And, and they had, you know, they, yeah, they, they, I guess they had to recuse themselves because any good defense attorney would have gotten a mistrial at that point. Because, hey, you have a press relationship, you can't do this. So they're going to have their day in court. But they, they yeah, this is. Yeah, you, yeah, it's like, just, you know, okay. and uh, so anyways, what this shirt is basically all about is just 
trying to get people to understand that we can have our differences. You know, we don't have to hate each other, you know, and uh, it's along those lines that this concept came up. I have a few more designs and I really I have a Facebook page, but I just try to push the good stories out there. I don't really try to push the shirts. because I'm not trying to, you know, like feed off it in a way, you know, so. Um, well, well, it's the content of your character, not the color of your skin, right? What that's was, the way it should be, right? Yeah, you know. So, um, your character, yeah, not- so I'm actually in the process of redoing the website right now. But again, I really just try to push the good stories, not push the shirts. I still have some, but yeah, you know, I'm not. Again, it's just, uh, you know, right. I, I have a new shirt that I made up, and I was going to. Uh, unveil it at the Arnold Classic. I was talking to the guys that I work with at the Arnold, whatever, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. Max Green Printing, and we were going to go ahead and set up and uh, work a deal out, and I'll display my shirts down there. But, of course, it didn't happen because the whole coronavirus thing. You know, but I I still, I'm still going to do something with it. I just have to have it set up properly. That's what I want to do. But, yeah, so this this is all about this people getting different, different races getting along, we may mm-hmm. disagree, and that's okay, but you don't got to hate each other. You don't got to yeah. use racial slurs. And both ways. Both ways, yeah. you know. So, And I can yeah. honestly say, you know, throughout uh, the wrestling, my wrestling career, uh, I really haven't, there really hasn't, I really haven't had too many issues, like any issues, really. I mean, I don't think of, oh. the only issue I had is, you know, the African American trooper letting me off and giving you a ticket. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so really, that worked in my favor against you. I, I, for me, you but. It was always funny because when I used to ask you, like, how old you were, you said, well, I'm this much in black years. You used to joke. I mean, did you joke about it? We've been friends for like 27 years. So like, that's good. Well, that's no joke. I am only 40 in black years, but. Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I don't know because of. Uh, I can say that, you know, in the gyms that I go to, the wrestling areas that I wrestle at, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's whatever size that I'm perceived to look like I have, I really haven't had any, uh, it really hasn't. I know there's issues out there in the wrestling business, probably. I really haven't encountered any, you know, and uh, hopefully it'll stay that way. Yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope that's the case, too. I mean, honestly, because I had... I've been in the ring. I always say this when you wrestle long and as long as we have, we've been in the ring with so many different people, so many different backgrounds, so many different races. You put your well being in the ring and they put their well being in the ring. You know, you know, you're putting their trust in each other when you're out there and you're working a match. It's just right. that, that's why I'm wrestling. It's, it's, it's always been that way. It's just like an unwritten rule. You're, we're all equal in that locker room. We're all we're, we're brothers. We're all brothers. That's why they say brother all the time. Brother. Right. Right. But that's that's the way it's supposed to be. But yeah, that's why I loved it when you did the shirts. I you, be honest with you, these people I disagreed with on an issue blocked me on Facebook. They won't talk to me. And I'm like, really, we've known each other for years. And th- my point about it was when when let's just let's just I'll just tell you what, what my, my viewpoint on something, which was the when they were protesting the national anthem. And I said, mm-hmm. if, if you're a high profile athlete in the city you live in, you know, somebody like, you know. You know, and if this is before Baker Mayfield was in the league, but somebody like a, a Baker Mayfield or an Odell Beckham Jr. because we're in Cleveland, or you can even, you can go to Pittsburgh and somebody like a um, what's the guy's name, Juju Smith Schuster, or somebody yeah. like that, you have an opportunity to to get together with people in your community, community leaders, police chiefs, city officials, uh, police officers, and really work towards getting good, tangible results. Instead, if you protest during the anthem, it's a two or three minute song, you're making it about yourself and you're, you're actually getting an emotional reaction out of people and you're not working towards getting any results. Which action would have been better? Which one would work better? That's, that's what I mean. That was, that was, that's why I disagreed with them doing that because I said, you're, just, you're not doing anything else. You have opportunities to really work towards doing a lot more positive things in the communities you play in. So. Whether I was wrong or not, fine. You could disagree with me on that point, but it was just, it was just because it kind of, it was based on emotion. You know what I mean? That's why it's gone. You don't see it happening much anymore. You're not even seeing any sports right now. 
what is based yeah. on so you know and i was to be honest with you you know i was like you know uh sure you can say you can say yeah. No, I would say that's probably not the proper way to do it, whatever, to get noticed, whatever, you know. Um, but, again, in light of recent events, you have yeah. to look what's worse. A guy getting shot on tape yeah. and not getting arrested or a guy kneeling. What's he kneeling about? Right. He's kneeling during the national anthem. So that these guys get arrested right away, <laughs> you know. Well, people have such so a you can, yeah. If you're disrespecting the flag, if you call that, what do you call disrespecting a guy that was shot by two guys on tape? What's yeah. worse, dying or kneeling down? Right, right, right. Any oh, guy no. that wants and to take me so that I can live, go right ahead. Yeah, and none of those guys. I would, I would never unfriend anybody for different thoughts. That's just stupid. None, none of those, none of those football players or athletes that did that went to jail for doing what they did. They were constitutionally protected. And you know what? You know, you, you have the right to do it. I'm not telling them they don't. I just, but I have a right to say, hey, you know what? There's a better way to do this. And I oh, just without a doubt. Yeah, you know. There's a better. Way to do it. That's, and, that and was, you, you got to almost look at too. What's the media not telling you? What if, what if, again, it's, you know, I, I don't want to get all into it, you know, but what's the media not telling you? Maybe yeah. this guy has done, maybe this guy, not not talking about anybody in particular, but maybe the guy has already given $500,000 to the underprivileged kids. Yeah. They don't tell you that, but no, they only show you the, they perceive to be the bad thing, whatever, you know. Kaepernick, so. My understanding, Kaepernick did do, a lot of charity work, as far as I know. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I think one had to do with homeless people. I know that. Um, I know he did do that, and he did. He did get a lucrative night deal from Nike. He still. I mean, he was. He was, might have been ostracized, but Nike took care of him. So he's not and, even. And their sales went up. What? Their sales went up. I think so. At least they always did. Yeah, I think they did. But yeah, it's, I think it's they did. not basically all about that. It's just. Well, you know. The long and short of it is, I just wish, wish people would just get along, leave everybody alone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's, that, social, it's that social media mentality. When you post something, you're just trying to get likes and so people to validate. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. Know, like when I give the charities, when I do my own charity stuff and I give the charities, I don't post it. Because it, that, that's not why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it to post it. I, I you know, I, I give, I do what I do. I donate. And I just, that's just, that's my thing. I do it. And it's, and, and there it is. So that's just, that's just it. Yeah, there's, there's things that are out there with all stories that you're not getting the whole story from the media on. And you got to do your own research and your own homework. So, but I've known you for 27 years and we're two different races. Never had a problem. Never. And yeah, anyway, it's just, okay. I'm not like that. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, again, it's just, it, it becomes little, and usually I'm not too vocal on like issues like on social media, you know, but this one was just little, it was a little, it was, it was a little too much just with, you know, all the crap going on and, and the coronavirus yeah. and this and that and politics and, yeah, but this, and to have this happen yeah. too. It was just like, man, it's just almost, I almost need to detach, you know, and just sort of, Disconnect for a little while, regroup. Disconnect, detach, yeah. and just, yeah. you know, if the gyms were open, I, I'd be there, you know, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm working from home. I'm fortunate to be able to be employed and work from home. My wife's working, for, was able to work still, too. So we still have an income coming in. And my daughter, my my oldest, they my, my two girls, they do like, they do preschool on Zoom now with their teacher. Okay. So we're, we're, we're adjusting to it. We're fine. But I mean, actually, I got a pair of clippers off of Amazon. My wife cuts my hair now. <laughs> <laughs> going. So it's like I said, throughout this whole thing, it's it, it's 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 an adjustment. It's been tough. But, you know, I, yeah. I think there's times I do. I do not just tell everybody I'm going dark or anything. I just kind of take a break from everything. I'll turn off the news. I'll go on YouTube and I'll either watch matches or I'll watch. I'll even look at old NFL games, stuff like that. Right. I'll, anything I feel like watching. You can find some pretty cool stuff out there, or you know. Yeah, that's. I, I think that's a good, healthy thing to do is like just sort of detach and 
Yeah. You know, you don't got to be one of these schmucks who say, oh, I think I got to leave Facebook for a while. And you guys are, dude, dude just leave. Just leave. <laughs> you know, you don't announce just, nobody cares about you. Nobody you gives know? a shit. Nobody gives a shit what yeah. you ate for breakfast. Nobody cares. Exactly. But, nobody um, cares. <laughs> Yeah, just who can, you know, do whatever you want to do. You know, you don't have to announce it. Whatever you know. Yeah, I think Facebook is for people that want to be famous but aren't. You know what I mean? And everybody wants to have that love, that fame. Everybody wants to have that 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 attention and that recognition. And you know, I'm not. I don't consider myself famous. And I don't think you, you do either. Even though, even though we wrestled on TV in front of thousands of millions of people that have tuned in back in the '90s, and we we've done a lot, but. I don't, I never, I never thought of that as being famous. I wouldn't want to be famous. I wouldn't want all that, and all that attention. I don't think I'd, you know, no, we, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'd want that. I'm kind yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. I, I, I don't. I don't know what everybody else wants, you know. But yeah, it, it's it's just. Uh, I, I know there's one thing that I that I do try to fitness and wrestling are really what I try to focus on in social media. You know, as far as other things, you know, it's just, it's just uh, it, it, they're energy drainers, you know. I, I, I don't need, and speaking for myself, I don't need the energy drainer trying to get, um, to get the bragging rights of who's right or who's wrong or whatever. It's just, you know, uh, whatever, you know. That's well, why, you know, I, 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 detachment for a while is a good thing, I think. That way you can focus on what really matters or what you're trying to achieve in your own personal life, you know. I, I, I don't know. Just do whatever you want to do. Well, if, if, you want your, if you want your private life to be private or stay private, then, you know, keep it that way. You know, just right. don't talk about it. <laughs> if you don't talk about it, you're fine. Yeah. Well, so, these, you see people that say, uh, I got something to say, but I can't tell you. Uh, what? You know, or they, or they, or they, they post something about like if you get like which something rarely happens between my wife and I. We disagree, we argue about something. I don't go on Facebook and talk about it. I have something to talk to my wife about. I do, I talk to her. You know, we we handle it ourselves. I, I could probably count on we've been together 11 years, we will be married seven years next year. I maybe count on one hand how many times we had disagreements and arguments. We get along that well. Okay, which is really people are surprised as a marriage. That's, that's what it's all about, man. I'm happy but, for you, man. That's what it's all about. We handle it with each other. We talk to each other. It's big. I think I'm, I, I was like, I got married like four days before I turned 40. I'm glad I waited because I, I'm in a very good marriage. I, I already got married in my 20s. I would have been divorced. I know that. So, so that's, right. but it's like, I, I tell young people now, I said, you know, we, if you, it's a good place to go keep in touch with people yeah keep up to date on the latest stuff fine but when you got a personal problem with somebody you sit down and talk to them one-on-one -on -one, or you talk to them in person you don't or you pick up the phone and call them or whatever but you don't just go on social media and air your dirty laundry because it's nobody yeah, else say, yeah did you say you and uh I, I was listening to mike's uh kid collins mike's thing did, did you have a thing with him or something like that and it wasn't didn't you say you apologized, something like that? Well, I apologized because... It's not a big thing, but just whatever, you know. I apologized to him in person. Well, one of the things I was... When I was in, in the 90s back then, I was partying a lot, and I had maturity issues. And mm -hmm. I just said, you know what? I was wrong. And you deserve an apology because there's things... He was putting up his own money on shows. I didn't know that. Right. And I was acting like an idiot. A jerk and i said you know what at that moment i kind of really felt like a first class heel and i said you know what you deserve an apology for me and he's like he's, it's, it's 20 years ago i said no i'm i it's only right i apologize I accept it that was it he goes it hit, you know he said it's over with it's fine he said you were young everybody's done things they regret in their 20s but there's certain ways i acted and i had maturity issues and that was me that was on me so that was it yeah that's all yeah i don't think i've ever had any uh i don't think i've had a any issues with uh, anybody, you know, at least I don't per perceive that I have, you know, maybe if you do a few more of these podcasts, maybe I'll find out. But as far as I know, you know, I really <laughs> I haven't have, had I don't think anybody, nobody I've known ever had to eat with you for any reason. You know, I remember the thing about um, you, Ron and Charlie, I always thought were very um, quiet, very modest. 
you know, Ron was quiet. Ron never complained about anything. And Charlie, I mean, to, to even hear him raise his voice, well, I've seen him get mad a couple of times. It's just like scary. It's like, whoa, when he's mad. It's like there's something wrong because Charlie never gets mad. <laughs> it's like, wow. That's, uh, that's one of the things that I've learned back from in the day that the locker rooms were mostly sort of quiet. You know, it was it wasn't like quiet, quiet, but it was just like, you know, you there's a lot more joking around nowadays, you know, which is, it's, it's fun to a certain point, whatever, you know, but when it's good time, when it's, was town, get time to get down to business, whatever, there's, there's a lot of joking around. There's seems to be yeah. less professionalism backstage, at least in what I perceive to be, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. It just, it gets, it's the, um, yeah, it's the, it's the, uh, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, the the times changed in a little bit, and yeah, yeah. School, new school are just a couple different things, whatever you know. So. There's stuff, yeah. They they had their girlfriends in the locker room, which was unheard of in my day. So you know, I, I remember those things. I've seen that happen. I've seen guys. Uh, I've just just seen some stuff that you know. They're, they're they're everybody's taught the same thing, like you know, go up, shake everybody's hand, and. Make sure you do this and just, you know, it just I understand what you're saying because you, you get the lack of professionalism in the locker room. But just the lack of, I would say, um, kayfabe would be the other word, too, because what I saw one idiot on Twitter. He took a picture of the lineup sheet before the show and it had everybody circled that was winning. And he tweeted mm -hmm. that great show. I'm like, I would have killed you. Why? Oh, why did yeah. You, why? Did, I mean, God, almighty. I mean, that's yeah. You would if, if we would have done anything like that, mm -hmm. we would have been, been gone. We'd have been. We Charlie would have kicked us out. I think if we would have done anything like that. I remember. Yeah, that's, that's unheard of. I mean, what? I remember one TV taping we were at. Guys from the other group that came up. I don't think it was the North Carolina guys. I can't remember. But they were going out and getting souvenirs from the stands, coming back into the locker room area and having the guys sign them for them. Do you remember that? No, no, I don't know. I was, I'm getting, I'm just so in awe of being around all these guys. I'm like, you know, but yeah, at that, I mean, they, yeah. they were idiots. Yeah, they were idiots. We kind of joked about it. And I remember who else, who else did we, who, Charlie would have killed us if we did that. <laughs> would have been done. He would never send us back. He would never, he would never send us back. He would have said no. He goes, because I remember being told, you don't make him look bad. He's sending you. Yeah. It's just, yeah. or, he, he, he said like, that. You know, yeah, it's his word. It's his way of, it's, of putting his trust into you that you're wearing Charlie's. You were we were all wearing the shirts that is a school it had his name on it. He's trusting you to go out. Even when you went out and work shows, he trusted you. So right, right. Top on that, but man, yeah, this, I, I love uh, you know, this has been a uh, this business has been good. I mean, uh, we some of our crew we've been fortunate enough to. Uh, get some small acting roles you know we have a movie coming out i don't know when uh because of the whole corona thing but uh there's a okay. movie called escape from death block 13 we filmed it almost two years ago i guess it's down to the final editing stages you know and so um there's that one i have a uh, a small role in a movie that was done in cleveland called um uh, the Green Lady, and oh, wow. uh, yeah, there's a, a director producer up here, uh, Donald Dawson. Uh, he's uh, put me in a role. He's got a few other ideals for me, you know. And and uh, I was in another small role called um, "Got to Get Down to It." I played a, a a police officer, a riot cop in that movie, you know. Uh, so again, the, the big one will be Escape from Death Block 13. A lot of the wrestlers from ASWA are in it, you know, and we had a good time. And those other guys are getting roles too in other places, you know. Um, they're doing their thing. Um, but it's going to be a great experience once the movie finally comes out. And that's going to be, um, as I get more involved with things like this, that could be my way to get out of wrestling, you know. Um, be an actor, you're gonna be, be an actor. Uh, I am also taking, a, I'm, I'm with a, a, a stunt crew called Stunt Predators that's based out of Madison, Ohio. And Chris Hahn got me involved in that, you know. That's it's awesome. 
they yeah, they do a lot of stunts out that way um as far as practicing and whenever some major movies come to Ohio usually they'll call my uh stunt instructor Rick Fike and um you know and uh it it uh, it's led to uh opportunities you know and uh with wrestling that's basically sort of like stunts anyway in a sense you know we know how to fall and yeah. um I found you. Know, you on, so. I found the Escape from Death Block thirteen on IMDb. I found it. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so uh, again with uh, some acting roles and doing some stunts, I cool. think that'll be my way out of the wrestling business. You know, so <laughs> you become an actor. Going to it's been a, it's been a real blessing. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Despite all the injuries, all the bumps, the bruises, the aches and pains. You know, in my mind, you still got to hit the gym. You still got to get the job done. Yep. This is so kind of how it is, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you what. When I talked to, when I talked to Jimmy, he he was still he still loves it. He's still happy to do it. So you know, if you if you're happy doing it, to continue to by all means. I I was getting to the point, um, like when my when my daughters were born, like my first yeah. one. I was just taking some time off, and then I was like, ah, you know, other things came up. I moved back a year later, and I was just like, I think I might have done one or two matches since then, but I'm not really in any rush to do anything. You know, I've always thought about doing the acting stuff. People ask me about that, but what happened with this, this podcast, I did um, I did a podcast a long time ago with a guy named Corey Castle, who threw a mutual okay. friend out, out in Philadelphia. And then we were doing another one. He said, he, he texted me, he said, Hey, we're in this quarantine thing. You got, you know, I, I'm just busting out a bunch of podcasts. You want to do another one? I said, Sure, we'll talk. You know, just to talk and you know, shoot the shit and whatever. And he kind of suggested to me to do one. And he goes, I was like, Really? He goes, Yeah, you're pretty good at this. You should be able to do one. And I went, All right, what should I call it? And it was just kind of funny. And I said, Well, Deep Stew Lou, call it the Stew Pot. <laughs> so I just thought it would be cool. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. And I always considered you a friend, and I always will consider you a friend, regardless of, um, you know, our, we're, we're from different backgrounds, where we, but we, what bonded us together was wrestling. I consider yeah. you a friend. We're from man, I, think, yeah. I think our core group of guys, man, I, I, think, I think they're just the best. And oh, absolutely. Just because of our, our history that we have. And I did have, um, I'll say, one to two guys somewhat in the movie business whatever um what well, I'm, I'm hoping to somehow get sort of like a documentary made up of all of our guys like or you know in, in one thing because there's so many different backgrounds right. we have a good our roots are just so they're bonded in the wwf in a sense you know um you got Barry Hardy, who was in there for, you know, quite a while. Yeah, Charlie, who was in there for quite a while. And all of us, we've done shows for them, but we've branched off. We've done different things. We're doing different things now. We're Some of us are still at it. Some yeah. of us have got issues going on. Some of us have got aches and pains, injuries, whatever. It's just a good story, and then it would be a good story, you know, I think. Yeah. so. Hopefully, I can get those guys to come to one of our matches, whatever, and just see what they can do and and build something. Yeah. So I'm trying to think about you know Derek. I'm going to talk to Derek in two weeks because next week's with Ronnie. Um, you know, like I said with Derek, you know, I remember he he went out and he went into radio for a while. You know, I definitely because he you know he he went off and did all, he went back west where he came from after he got trained. I think he worked for Harley Race and did a lot of training with Harley Race out there. So right. He, 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 he did a lot. He branched off in his own way. And I, I went off. I did a lot of my stuff in Pittsburgh um, and Western PA overall because I did, because I got in with Steel City. Because, uh, you know, you know, how the, you know, I, I was I, 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 I tell people the story how that happened. I got a call from Zoltan on a Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. Because someone was going to make it to the show. I came down there and I worked for I worked for the show and uh, I worked. I ended up wrestling T. Ranchula and the okay. guy managed T. Ranchula was norm connors and he started he was starting his own promotion called steel city wrestling he liked me as a baby face and he wanted me to work and work with t because we had such a good match 
So that's how right. I kept, that, that's how I got in. And he's like, and then, then he liked Frank too. So Frank and I always, because he figured, okay, you guys can ride together. Frank lived in Lakewood. I lived in Brooklyn. We always right. rode together. We were been real close. So yeah, we've always been real close. It's been fantastic. So Frank, I got to get Frank on. I got to get Frank on. I, I text him. I call him once in a while. He's not on Facebook. He's not on Twitter. But he he likes to watch YouTube stuff. He'll send me matches. I'll send him matches. And uh, yeah. like, hey, so like there's one, there's a match with uh, Charlie and Larry Sharp. It was in Philadelphia at the Spectrum. It was okay. Charlie and Larry in like our early 80s. It was a great match. Charlie and Larry always had really good matches. I sent it to Frank. He goes, yeah, I saw that. I think there was another one. Um, God, it was the one I saw. I sent him. It was a tag match. It was um, okay. it was a it was Adonis and Murdoch against Rotundo and Barry Windham, and it was just just the psychology of it was beautiful. Just how well they worked together, and it was just like I said back then. You don't see matches like that today because everything's scripted out and laid out for them. But it it's it's a different business now. Yeah, oh, definitely yeah. a different business. It's it's a show. It's an entertainment business now. You know, which is fine. That's great. You know, but well. Did you hear these rumors? That I, I'm hearing rumors. I don't know how true they are because they might just be rumors. WWE is about to sell to Disney. Did you hear about that? Uh, I mean, I think I thought I thought I read something where was it Disney or ESPN they were going to sell to? Well, I think Disney owns ESPN because it's ABC. Yeah. I, okay. I, Whatever. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. It wouldn't be I, news to me. I, I mean, it would be. Again, I don't. I don't follow it, so I don't even know what it would be to me. It would be nothing to me. <laughs> I don't, you know, who cares? I, I, you know? I'll tell you what, they, oh God, I can't imagine. I just, I just, it was just, oh, <laughs> I just like shake my head just thinking about it. Because it's, well, easy, you know, so what? it's, it's either going to make them or it's going to break them. Yeah. And if it breaks them, it could be, it could be the beginnings of a resurgence for the independent scene more. More territories again. Yep. It you could know? be. I'm thinking this whole coronavirus might be an opportunity as a reset for the business, a reset for almost everything, because right now raw ratings are at the lowest they've ever been. I know that. I don't know how about SmackDown. I don't know how bad, and, and they're on Fox. So I, right. I don't know. I don't know how true this is because I mean Disney bought everything. They bought Marvel. They bought Star Wars. You know, they bought Pixar. They just they just buy up everything. So why not buy WWE and then you have rides like the Undertaker roller coaster at Disneyland or something like that? I'm not uh, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, well, I tell you what. Once this coronavirus thing is, I don't know, over or at least a lot lower, it'll be real interesting physically to see how that first body slam or whatever. You know, it'll be really interesting to see how anybody, how they take that first match, you know. I'm yeah. definitely going to be taking some bumps in the ring weeks and weeks prior to get ready, you know. But it'll be a real interesting to see. What's interesting is really the next morning. That's where all the, at least for me, after the match is over, you know, you're still on that adrenaline and high, you know. But the next morning, getting up, Pretty much now, it took me a good five minutes to get everything moving and, you know, everything, you know, this clicks, you know, there's kneecaps off to the one side, you know, there's herniated disc, you know, there's issues, but we keep, we keep plugging along. So after that first match, it's going to be interesting to see the next morning how well everybody is. All right. All right, man. Well, right. hey, this this I want to say this. It's been fun. It's been a pleasure. Uh, before I, before we end this, is there one oh, thing? Shit, that, there. Uh, is one thing I always ask about. What's that one final thought you got for everybody? Uh, oh. mm, Don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> one final thought. I'll just say this: inspirational strength, strong together, fitness and unity. Just, just everybody be cool, you know. I mean, again, who's gonna listen to me? Nobody. But just, it's okay to disagree. Just don't hate somebody because of the color of their skin. Absolutely, right on, man. And, it don't, and you know, and, and uh, just to add to that a little bit, don't hate, don't hate somebody because they might think they're different than you. Yeah, yeah. But if you are a black cop, an African American cop, and an African American trooper, in Marion, Ohio. And you see 
a, a black ranger, do not pull him over. <laughs> Let him go. It was almost 30. It was like that was 1993. I think that was summer 93 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> 27 years ago almost. That's God. I'll never forget that. I got the ticket. I'm like, ah, oh, what's going on? But all right. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for listening to the stew pot. Please like and subscribe and share. We really appreciate you listening. I appreciate everybody listening. I'll be back next week with Ronnie Nicole. Thank you again. All right. Take care. Thanks, Lou. This